Thank you. Thanks, Craig. And it's great to be to be back here after a few minutes of, uh, of a break. I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands from which we're dialing here today. We have hundreds of people dialing from all corners uh, across Australia. And it's, uh, it's really great to see and have these opportunities to talk to you uh, and share this, uh, this test with you. Um, we have spent a couple of years talking a lot about the global pandemic and our lives, personal lives and work lives being very focused on that for good reason. But now that we're in the post-vaccination part of the pandemic, we actually want to start looking ahead, looking forward into the challenges that we have this decade and next decade uh, on our journey to climate, to net zero emissions and to becoming a more sustainable built environment. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to look in particular at the changing role of buildings in the path to net zero. They, the role of buildings is changing. And we're going to look into why that role is changing, what are the factors that are driving that change, and also what is a program like NAEP is doing to try to stay ahead of those changes and channel the change in the direction where it's going to help buildings, Australian buildings being not just get to net zero, but also help all the parts of the Australian economy to, uh, to get to net zero uh, sooner. So we're going to do that today. And I'm going to start by looking at three challenges that we are facing today and some of these factors that are driving, uh, the, changing the way we look at buildings. And the first one of them is the fact that electricity demand is growing and it's growing in for a, a lot of good reasons. I'm just, uh, I think this slide's maybe um, in the wrong spot, but I am, we might be fixing on that. In the meantime, I'm actually gonna, gonna tell you one of the reasons why, um, uh, why this, the role of buildings is changing is that electricity demand is growing and it's growing for very good reasons. On the one hand, we talked in the previous session with, uh, with, uh, with Frankie and, and Davina about uh, how buildings are electrifying, electrifying their heating, electrifying their cooking. And that's a, a trend that is already happening in, in, in the, the early days of that trend growing. We also hear a lot about electric vehicles. And I think all of us have seen that conversation uh, growing and growing. And most predictions see that electric vehicles are going to become a really big part of uh, of our economy in the next couple of decades. And we also have a lot of discussions about green hydrogen as being a, you know, a, a source of potentially zero emissions or very low emissions uh, fuels, and, and the, and which, is, which is great. Green hydrogen is uh, great. We, don't, we still don't have the, the slides ready, but um, uh, green hydrogen is a very, very deep user of electricity. In, uh, in, in it, it's expected to grow quite a bit of demand in terms of electricity. So we have, you know, the electrification of buildings, we have a green hydrogen, and we have a, a significant uh, grow in, in electric vehicles. Um, and that is uh, growing the amount of demand. And I think those are things that are, it's really important that those things happen. Every single report from the International Energy Agency, all the way to um, the, um, all the way to Climate Works in Australia, every study showing that we actually need to electrify those uses. So it's the electrification of the Australian economy. But the reason why it's important to mention that is that it, the growth in demand is also a significant challenge uh, to, um, to Australia. It means that we have to, you know, if, if climate change is a race to 100% renewables, the more electricity we use and the more demand grows, it's a race that is getting longer and longer by the day. And so that is one aspect of challenge in, in with a growing electricity demand. The other challenge is that the more electricity demand we have in, in our cities in particular, the more we have to invest in distribution and, 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 and basically poles and wires. And so when, if we have an uncontrolled growth in demand, it actually can cost quite a bit. So it can make the race not just longer, but also more costly. And I think this is a space where buildings have a really big role to play. Um, buildings can actually do a lot to make room for the electrification of, of other parts of, of the world economy. And I think if you look at, a, um, if you look at, a, I'm going to show you a graph that talks about um, how, uh, what, the kind of change that we've seen in, here in, in Neighbours. Um, so what this, uh, this graph is showing is, um, um, is, I'm just looking at the slides right here. So what this graph is showing is every office building that we have ever certified under Neighbours. And because uh, in, in offices, we have the commercial building disclosure program. So we have mandatory disclosure of energy performance. Uh, this line is basically every office building you've ever been or you've ever seen, and, and the majority of them. And what we do is we take the first rating that any of them has, has, uh, has uh, the first time they've been certified in the neighbors, and we use it as a baseline. And we see, are buildings using less energy when they come back a year later? And the answer is yes, they're using about 3% less energy 
than the first year. How about the second year? The answer is about 5% less energy. And it keeps improving all the way to uh, if the average building reduces about 33% of their energy consumption once they've been in neighbors for about 10 years. And it keeps going from there. Uh, and the reason why I think this is an incredible insight and a really important thing to reflect on is that this is the fastest reduction of energy consumption in any sector of the Australian economy, and by quite, quite some margin. Uh, and it's not just cherry picking, it's not just the leaders, this is the entire of the, of the office sector. Um, by the way, it's also not just the fastest in Australia, it's likely the fastest reduction of energy consumption of any building sector in any country around the world. And every time we show that to our colleagues in, in Europe and in North America, they're also very surprised and, and, and really amazed by the progress in, in the Australian um, office market. Now, some people look at this kind of statistics and they think that there's something really special about the office market in Australia that very unique. That means that these savings are possible there, but they're probably not possible in, in other sectors. And by this point, we have um, data from a, a different sector, which is shopping centers in Australia. And you might be seeing this on, on the screen now. And we actually have certified a significant portion of shopping centers. It's not every shopping center because we don't have mandatory disclosure. We don't have CBD in shopping centers, but it's a very successful voluntary tool. We certify about two thirds of the floor space of shopping centers in Australia today. Um, and we see them reducing energy consumption, but it's similar, very similar rate. In fact, faster than, than offices. But keep in mind that probably the other third of the market is not moving as fast uh, as, as these two thirds. Um, and what this uh, uh, tells me and, and uh, us at Neighbours is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a show of amazing leadership, uh, but it's not a surprise that we've seen shopping centres improving at a similar rate than offices because the, the equipment that uses energy in a shopping centre is the same than in offices. It's heaters and chillers and lighting and, and vertical transport. In fact, it's the same than in hospitals and it's the same than in schools and in hotels and any other, you know, medium to large building across the country. These savings are possible in this quantity across the building sector. Um, so let me take this back into why, why is this important to reflect on. We have been able to achieve savings in a scale that it, most countries have never seen across entire sectors of the built environment. <clears throat> um, and if we were able to replicate this across some, you know, six, seven, eight or 10 sectors, subsectors of the building sector, this will create an enormous amount of space for the electrification of other items in the Australian economy. So this is the building sector making room for other sectors of the economy to electrify faster and at a lower cost. So it's not just about electrifying buildings. This goes a little bit into what Davina was talking about earlier today. It's about buildings. This is how buildings can integrate with other sectors and help others to actually move and collectively get to net zero faster. We're actually going to have a really great session on the role of energy efficiency in net zero under stream two at 120. So if you're interested in that, you can go straight uh, into that. Now, a key ingredient in, in both here in shopping centers and, and offices was that there was a, the availability of neighbors ratings. So buildings could measure where they are in their journey and we can, they can set targets for next year in two years as an individual building, as a portfolio. So we had that in these two sectors, but we don't have neighbors ratings in all sectors. And so like Duncan mentioned just a few minutes ago, we've been doing a lot of work to expand neighbors to more and more sectors of the built environment so we can begin the journey of creating this whole of market drivers that can drive a little change at scale. We released residential aged care and retirement living that tool a few months ago in October 2021. We've done a lot of work on to expand neighbors to industrial warehouses and coal stores and that work is very progress and we're hoping to launch that in the next couple of months so a little bit later in 2022 and we literally just started the process of expanding neighbors to private and public schools as well as retail tenancies in outlets. So that is coming next year. If you're interested in any of these sectors and you want to be part of those processes, we'd love to work with you. We are already working with lots of people in these sectors, but if we haven't talked to you or you're not involved, please let us know. We'll love to work with you. So that is the first sector, you know, reducing uh, energy consumption, making room for the, the electrification of the economy. Um, I want to talk about a second challenge and a second driver of how we're we're looking at buildings a little bit differently. And the second is came a lot in the discussion session this morning, and it's the fact that we must reduce significantly or eliminate fossil fuels across millions of buildings. And I, I, I want to reflect for a minute on what that means. We have millions of buildings, potentially five, six, seven million dwellings that use gas today. We have hundreds of thousands of commercial buildings that have gas uh, today. And that gas is not gonna go away 
through the electrification of the electricity, the, the decarbonization of the electricity grid. Uh, that's not going to happen automatically. A lot of these buildings require a, a you know, focused work, a project, to be able to actually electrify them. And so we're talking about electrifying potentially millions of buildings, which is what the International Energy Agency is saying, is what Climate Works said as well in their seminal report on this last year for Australia in particular. But the challenge is tremendous. Millions of buildings means that you will have to electrify thousands of buildings. Imagine 5,000 buildings this week and another 5,000 buildings next week and doing that all the way to, 20, uh, to 2040 for 20 to 25 years, electrifying you know, thousands of dwellings and buildings every week. We're nowhere near that at the moment. Our market is not there. We don't have the capability, the supplies to be able to do that at that scale. And we need to grow that. And we need to grow that from now because we only have a couple of decades to get to where we need to be. Um, so it is a big challenge, but we are actually taking steps, strong steps in that direction. And NEMPAS actually made a change to the way we do ratings last year. And Frankie made a, a, a reference to this early on today. And I want to show you the impact of this change. This is a change that has been approved, it's already in place, and we think it's going to start to create a lot of very strong incentives to removing on-site fossil fuels in buildings. So I want to show you an example here on the screen. This is uh, an example for uh, in, in Adelaide. You can actually do this and look at your own building, whatever your building is. You can go onto our website. We have tools for you to be able to do this. But it's two buildings that are identical. They have the same neighbors rating today. Um, and, but one of them is full electric already, and the other one has a 50% of on-site fossil fuels on site. So the amount of megajoules on site, 50% of them are coming from gas. Um, and we are making a change to neighbors every five years. Every five years, we're changing the emission factors we're using to calculate the neighbors rating. We're updating them. And we're updating them because electricity is becoming lower and lower carbon over time. Uh, so what's happening with these two buildings is that even though they have the same neighbors rating today, the next change we, when we do this in 2025, we're going to see the all-electric building go up. And then the rating of the all-electric building go up again in 2030 when we make this change again. And that is simply reflecting the fact that that building is becoming lower and lower carbon every year. So this is something that is already been recognized in neighbors. And if you have a full electric building or you electrify during that time, you're actually going to see that a significant increase on your rating. Um, if you do not uh, electrify and you have a significant amount of fossil fuels in your building, you're going to see your rating decline over time. And that is simply reflecting that your building is becoming one of the ones, the buildings that have the most on-site fossil fuels and the highest emissions in, in that market. So it's just reflecting what is really happening in, in, in the electricity grid. Uh, and this is a change that is already out there. We did a couple of years of consultation in 2019 and 2020, uh, and it was first released, the first change happened in 2021, and the next one is coming in 2025. And we wanted to make sure that you knew about this. A lot of you participated uh, on this because it's important. If you have a boiler replacement coming in 2023 or 2025 or 2027, it's important that you know that because uh, your decision on, on what are you going to do about that energy consumption will have an impact on, on your rating. So we wanted to socialize this. We have some great tools uh, on this. And we also have a session a little bit later on uh, talking about, uh, I think it's a stream number one at 1230, uh, when we'll go a little bit deeper into, into some, of this, uh, in some of these changes. And I wanted to thank the, the hundreds of people in industry that championed this change in neighbors. We made this change because a significant portion of the built environment came forward and said, Neighbors actually has to make a change to recognize the value, the increasing value of all electric technologies. And we have done that. We think this is going to drive an enormous amount of change going forward. Uh, and we'd love to work with you. If, if, uh, if you're, it's the first time you see this, please reach out, feel free to reach out to us and we'd love to work with you on what this means for you. Now, I do want to talk about the third challenge here, which is uh, about reducing embodied carbon in buildings. So we talked about um, electrification, reducing energy consumption, and, and some of those things go a long way to reduce your operational emissions, but it doesn't really reduce the, the emissions at the point of construction and, and materials. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, embodied emissions. It's something that is really grown as a topic, and a lot of the sector has woken up to, to this issue in the last two or three uh, years. Um, and we, as, as neighbors, we've been doing a lot of work on embodied carbon in the last 10 months. We actually put a team together. We're doing, we did six months, really big market research phase where we interviewed about 200 people from, I think, a, just over 100 organizations. And we're talking, representing basically all the different players that operate around embodied carbon, from you know, the designers and architects working on, on projects 
to building owners that are commissioning that, construction companies, also the manufacturers of steel and aluminium and, and glass, a lot of the manufacturers of, of products that are going into buildings, policymakers, local councils, everybody working in the environment of how do we create new buildings and how to make them as low carbon as possible. Um, and a lot of people have struggled. They, they had a lot of uh, struggles on how to engage and how to actually drive action on embodied emissions. Uh, and some examples of that, a lot of people found this to be very complex. It's complex to navigate, and because it's complex, it can also be costly to navigate the, the reducing embodied carbon emissions in buildings. Most people, almost everybody, mentioned the issue of comparability. If you take two different consultants, very qualified, to assess the same building, they can get to drastically different assessments of the embodied carbon emissions in that building. And that's because we don't have a national framework on how to measure this. So you can measure the emissions from steel and cement very differently in, in, in several different ways. And even when it comes to the building itself, there's a question about, do you just take the structure? Do you go into the facade? How about the mechanical services? Is it just now the construction phase and upfront carbon, or are you looking at the emissions in 10, 20, 30, 50 years? There's all kinds of ways of doing that, which means that buildings are very difficult to compare. And because they're difficult to compare, it's difficult to actually have plan meaningful planning policies that could drive action in this space in the future, or have investor reporting in an ecosystem where it's actually very difficult to do. Uh, so that's a really big issue that came out very strongly. And also, because we don't have a national framework, a lot of people raise the issue about the risk of policy fragmentation. If you have a local council that is in a position to lead on embodied carbon, they don't have a framework to reference. So they have to create their own. They have to create their own tool. They have to create a calculator. So you're risking the fact of having 20 different policies that are in, in getting the whole sector swimming in all kinds of directions, but not really moving very fast. Um, so that's a summary of, of, uh, of the feed that we got. And because of that, neighbors, we are working on developing a national framework for measuring, comparing, and reducing the emissions of buildings. We're doing that with industry. We're designing that together. A lot of you are, that's why we interview so many people as well. We're also working with them on on the design phase. We want this to be consistent and national, a national framework that can be used across the country. It will be used, it, that can be used for neighbors, but not just for neighbors. That can also be used for other schemes. Uh, in, in case in point on that is that we are working very closely with the Green Building Council, and they're looking to integrate this framework straight into the Green Star tools as well. So we are actually trying to do this in a way that every initiative and every scheme that is working in this space could use this framework and be consistent in the way we measure materials and buildings. Um, and finally, that is a framework that is scalable. We have anywhere between 10 to 20,000 new buildings being built in Australia every year. Uh, and the number of buildings that are using embodied carbon as a real design constraint is very, very small. We're very far from that. If we ever want to get into embodied carbon being a meaningful design decision, it actually needs to be uh, high quality at the lowest possible cost. And we are working very hard on doing that, something that can scale uh, to, to that point. Now, we're going to have a session on this. It's uh, stream number one uh, at 1.20 p.m. So if you're really interested in embodied carbon uh, and you want to hear more about this, uh, you can join that session a little bit later on. Um, now, I do want to pivot and say that Australia has a really big platform for change. These challenges are big challenges, but I'm actually really optimistic. I think we have a lot of organizations, institutions, policies by government and industry that can really help us scale up. And I wanted to show you, for example, just this little screen. This is from us, a neighbors, combination of neighbors and CBD together. But if you were walking today in any of the five capital cities in the middle of the CBD area, you'll literally be surrounded by buildings that are tracking their emissions, setting targets for carbon reduction using, using neighbors, and not only that they've done that recently, these are buildings that have been doing that year on year for 12 years now, which is really unique. There's hardly any country in the world that can actually point to something like this with this, this number of buildings in this level of robustness of the measurements. Um, and not only that, but like we saw before uh, with, with Duncan and some other graphs that I showed earlier, these buildings are reducing energy consumption at an incredible speed. They are demonstrating that change, very fast change is really possible. Um, I want to he wouldn't show you a little bit more about how we have talked a lot about carbon and today there's been a lot of discussions about energy and carbon because it's very, very topical right now. But I want to show you that building sustainability is bouncing back from the pandemic and it's bouncing back beyond just energy. And what you're looking at this graph is this is just one uh, indication uh, of this, which is that just the number of neighbors ratings that we have seen right now in the last in the 12 months to today compared to the last financial year before the pandemic. So 
you know, what have we seen? What have we seen in 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 the space? And we have seen a growth of about 17 percent more buildings joining on energy and carbon. So that's great. It's really good to see continuing uh, continued uh, buildings coming forward in 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 a lot of sectors. Uh, we've seen a 20 percent growth on water consumption, which is great. Uh, often building off energy consumption, a lot of buildings that join with energy and carbon first, and then they become interested in water use. Uh, and, but we've seen an absolute incredible 86% growth on buildings certifying the indoor environment quality. And that's really building, that's not a huge surprise because uh, there's a lot of interest in health and well-being coming from the, the couple of years we've had on the pandemic. But this was a rating tool that came off 10 continuous years of growth before the pandemic actually started. So at this point, we're certifying about a third or maybe even 40% of the whole office market under indoor environment every year. And I think that really shows just how much interest in, in the indoor environment has, has grown. Um, the last one is, is waste and circular economy. And the growth is so big that I actually had to change the scale of the graph. It just didn't fit in the, in the previous graph. But we've seen more than a 200% growth on the number of uh, neighbors waste ratings we've seen in this market. And I think that just reflects that the circular economy is, uh, you know, used to be a wave and now it's a tsunami. You've seen so many organizations going really deep into the supply chains and the materials that are coming into the buildings. Uh, we've seen a lot of owners going just beyond energy, beyond just the waste consumption in, in their buildings. And, and they're just looking into, well, what is the best thing that we can do with this recycling? Like, can we make sure that this doesn't get turned into things that can't be recycled anymore? Can we just go into better outcomes of that waste? So whatever we recycle from this piece of glass can actually become, you know, have multiple different lives <clears throat> afterwards. So a lot of really growth on circular economy, which I think is, is fantastic. And we as a program are very interested in looking for ways to expand our work both on indoor environment and on ways beyond just the office sector. And we're actually looking at how we can do that in, in the next couple of years. Now, I want to close by talking a little bit about sustainable finance before we go in, into questions, because it's been such a big wave of change and such a transformative force in, in the built environment. Uh, as you may know, we do have a, a you know, a one avenue where Neighbors has been doing a lot of work, which is the Neighbors Sustainable Portfolios Index, which is, uh, you can see it on the screen now, it's literally a ranking uh, of 50 different property portfolios on different markets, particularly in offices and shopping centers on energy, water, waste, in their environment. And what they're doing is that they're coming in and they're disclosing the entire performance of the whole market side by side against their own competitors. And... I find this, I, I love this. I think there is, uh, to me, every single one of those 50 portfolios or 54 portfolios this year are, a, you know, are willing the transparency uh, side of sustainability. They're having the confidence to say, yes, this is where I am on my sustainability journey. And yes, I know that only one of those 54 portfolios will be at the top of the ranking. All the other ones won't be at the top. And them having that confidence to come forward and say, this is where we're at. We made a lot of progress. We still have a long way to go and we are going to be really transparent. That's exactly what we need across all sectors of the economy to be able to get to net zero. So we're really proud of this. We've seen lots of banks and financial organizations coming into this ranking and using it and looking at the properties inside and using the portfolio scores, issuing even loans linked to, you know, the link to the score in this ranking and, 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 and improvements over time. And I think that's great. We're very proud uh, of every single company that is working here. So that is one aspect of sustainable finance that we have for a few years. And building up the back of that, we'll be wondering, uh, can we do more? Can we do more to help accelerate the, the positive impact that sustainable finance has? Uh, and we're doing a lot of work in the last 12 months in particular. And again, we did do a market feasibility phase, a market research phase, uh, where we're asking people, you know, what are, are there barriers in, in the market um, on sustainable finance that is preventing sustainable finance to drive more change in buildings. And we heard lots of different uh, perspectives. A, a lot of people said that there's, there's a lot of credibility issues with some financial instruments that literally they just seem like somebody paint them green and, and, and somebody issued you know, a, a loan or something against it and called it sustainable, but they're not really driving very meaningful change. Um, and all the way to the other side of the scale where people, a lot of organizations were trying to drive real change and making sure that their bonds or, or loans were, were really sustainable, but they actually had to navigate a lot of complexity and, and, and costs and, and, and processes that are very time consuming. So it's very difficult because they have to define what is green enough 
to be called a, a green loan. Uh, and so a lot of projects have to do that every time they actually go through something like this. Um, so we had a lot of that, and we'll be doing a lot of work to try to create something that is, uh, that is really robust and is driving real change, but at the same time that is actually really simple to navigate, because I think it's, it's a lot of the value that neighbors can bring to this. Uh, and a couple of days ago, we just launched the Neighbors Sustainable Finance Criteria, which is literally a framework with two or three, three very specific methodologies. You, you can read, you can understand them in a couple of minutes. They define the, the, what high environmental criteria would be for that. And then you can issue certified green loans against them. So very practical methodologies. It takes a lot of the complexity uh, out, of, um, out of issuing green loans and, and green bonds. Uh, and it's the first iteration of something that we're hoping to increase and grow in the future. So these methods are based are for individual buildings and for portfolios. At the moment, they're focused on energy and carbon, but they could well expand into water and waste and into environment quality. And we've had more than 10 pilots actually going through this uh, in, the last, in the last few months. There's been a lot of really early interest on this, and we launched this a couple of days ago, and really want, we really want to see it uh, growth in the future. So if you do work in the sustainable finance space, we actually have a session on this as well a little, a little bit later on. Uh, it's uh, stream number two at 1230, where we're going to take a deep dive with a lot of people that help us build this framework uh, as well. Um, now, I do want to close and, and just say a couple of comments to close off uh, on this. Um, I've spoken a lot about these really big challenges that we are, we are facing, you know, electrifying millions of buildings, uh, drastically reducing embodied carbon in buildings, reducing energy consumption at scale so they can make a meaningful, buildings can make a meaningful contribution to decarbonizing Australia. And these challenges are hard and, and they are very hard. And we're not doing them because they're easy. We are doing them because they're hard because we have to do them. We know every international and domestic report tells us that those things are critical for Australia to be able to get to net zero emissions. Um, and we have seen the scale of change that all of you are driving in buildings today. It's unprecedented, and especially in sectors like offices and, and shopping centers. Um, and we actually want to do everything we can to scale that, to help you scale your impact across many other sectors in, in the built environment. Um, so we can, you know, so we can, buildings can become uh, and realize the, that significant potential um, for, for driving change. We know that potential is there. Every report talks about that potential. We think that we have found a way where we can scale that up and we have to do it together. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close there. I know that we may have a, a, few, a few questions uh, there, Craig, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to close it there. And I think we can go to Q&A. Thank you, Carlos. That's fantastic. Um, yep, lots of questions come in. I just first wanted to ask about the expansion of neighbours. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you show those graphs of 30% reduction in energy use across different sectors, 39% in retail, incredibly impressive numbers. I guess the first question is, uh, is there a move to make that mandated more broadly? But also, Frankie said earlier that neighbours should be on every building. You know, is there any likely, can this be applied to the residential housing market? You know, is there, are you looking at that as well? Like, how far can we expand neighbours? Right, so I think it's a, there's, a few, there's a few questions there. The first one is that there's been a review in 2019 uh, on whether the mandatory disclosure of neighbours should be expanded to other sectors. Um, and that process was, there were a few recommendations about that, about expanding to some, some sectors, but that process was halted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's very understandable. But I think now that we're coming through the post-vaccination uh, phase of the pandemic, where a lot of things are starting to reopen, it's probably the right time to look into that, in, into that, process, uh, uh, into that process again. Um, and that is uh, something that the Commonwealth government runs uh, this policy, and it's something that I think they will be looking into, looking into in, into the future. Obviously, the government is very early days; it's only been around for uh, for just over a week, um, and this is the kind of things that can take a little bit of time before they get a, a hard look into. But I think, to me, the the key takeaway from this is that uh, mandatory disclosure is uh, arguably the single most successful policy for existing buildings in any country ever. Uh, at reducing energy consumption and emissions. And I think is we've had this policy for 12 years and every year we keep seeing energy savings. And I think that thinking that this policy doesn't have a place in, for all the building sectors, I think is, a, is such a strong lever that I think will be hard to, to pass on. And, and I do think we need to look at, look at it into uh, very closely. It actually has a second dimension as well. A lot of people talk about electrification today. But we have made changes to neighbours that will drive, help significantly encourage electrification in the next decade or two. 
Um, so mandatory disclosure, what it does is it amplifies the impact of neighbors to do that beyond just the buildings that are at the tip of the spear in sustainability, and it drives them across the whole sector. So it can be a, a really big mechanism to drive a lot of the change that we need in buildings, not just reducing energy consumption. Mm. Now, when it comes to residential, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a complex uh, space, Craig, because uh, the residential sector has had uh, many, many different ratings. So it's a very fragmented space, both in industry and in government. And it's part of the reason why we've seen, um, you know, commercial buildings are considered to be in Australia, the number one most sustainable uh, sector in a lot of the international rankings in this space. Residential sustainability is often like in towards like the last spots in the OECD in comparable countries, the developed economies. Um, and that is in, in big part because of this fragmentation. The, the Commonwealth government has been doing great work in the last year on trying to unite uh, all policymakers in different states and have a, a, a you know, a, a central approach to things like disclosure. And a lot of the work is actually gonna start coming out uh, in, in 2022. So we do have a real chance to be able to have, a, you know, all of us who are looking into getting into the buyer's market, for example, to be able to have that information there. Uh, and also we have a real chance to be able to have national mechanisms that target renters. And there were some really good comments about that too as well. Uh, now, you, you did scare me when you had your graph about waste there. And it was initially at 0%. And I was thinking, oh, there's been no growth. In there. <laughs> and then it was 215%. You talked about the, the waste ratings are growing exponentially. What is Neighbours doing to support that growth? Like, what are they doing in the waste space? Yeah, so we're doing a few, a, a few things. First of all, a lot of our work is actually about enabling others. Um, when we, a Neighbours rating is, a, is basically measures when you are on your journey but the work that you, you have to do it yourself, if you're the building owner or the facility manager or the waste consultants who are working with those, uh, those agents to help them uh, improve. So a lot of our focus in the last uh, few years has been on making sure that uh, our rating tools are really robust, that we're actually reaching a lot of people in the market. And in particular, we've had a lot of interest in, we've released this tool about four years ago in its first iteration, and we just made a lot of, a, a number of changes because people wanted the neighbors tool to actually help not just increase recycling on site, hmm. but let's start focusing on where is this recycling going? Um, what is happening with this paper? Are we getting more paper out of it? Can we have multiple lives of paper out of that recycling? Or are we just gonna chop it and put it on, you know, as filling for a road and that's the end of that. And next time you need some paper, you need to go and cut some trees. So people are really focused on, let's make sure this is more than just putting things in the recycling bins. Let's start driving towards a real circular economy and making sure that we're looking at the end of life for those products. And, and I mean, that's the central, I, I'm constantly frustrated by the fact that I talk to people who are trying to do the right thing, trying to be part of a circular economy. And they say, well, the problem is that the, the virgin material is still far cheaper. Like, you know, is that something where neighbors can take, uh, play a part in saying, hey, you know, government, the problem here that you're not getting a circular economy because the incentives are not there. The cost structure is still the opposite of what you're actually asking for. I think is a I think is a great point. And every time I hear the word, you know, the cost is not there. Let me give you an example that is the intersection of circular economy and and carbon, which is embodied embodied materials, embodied carbon in building, steel, aluminium, cement. Um, you can source a lot of those materials with recyclable uh, with recyclable content, or maybe in, in the case of aluminium, for example. Uh, you can get aluminium, it's relatively low melting point, it's easy to recycle, it's very abundant. Um, you, can, you can turn new aluminium with very, very low carbon content compared to new aluminium. Um, and I think that is exactly the, the, the kind of things that we want to drive. I think on an embodied carbon tool, we're looking at it with that lens. We're just going, can we reduce carbon and significantly encourage the market for, for new products? Mm. And maybe if we take it one step further, um, Every time you demolish a building, that is also materials and it's also waste. And a lot of that's going straight to landfill when you could actually have um, a much stronger focus on let's reuse the majority of this structure is fine. We can just, what is the minimum that we can take away when we do this redevelopment? And can we reduce our emissions by 70, 80%? And can we reduce our materials by 70, 80% by reusing our existing built environment when we do that? That was an interesting part of the conversation here this morning was, was talking about, Jan was talking about buildings that are so bad, we can't get them up to neighbor's standard. What do we do with them? But of course, once you start factoring the embodied carbon and you know, it, it balances, I mean, there's a question about this on just come in. 
What are your thoughts on the impact of reducing operating carbon through the addition of embodied carbon, sun shades or facade build-ups? Surely total carbon for the life of the building is where we should all be focused when discussing carbon. Yeah, and I think the, the, the answer is uh, yes. I think the, as an economy, the goal is to reduce all emissions to, to zero. Um, and in sustainability, we have a lot of trade-offs. There are a lot of things that do uh, you know, better in one aspect but take away from another. Let me give you an example that is in every, almost every large tower that you've ever been to, any building that has multi-stories. Uh, a lot of them use a thing called the cooling towers. What it is, is if you have air conditioning, you need to get rid of that heat somewhere. One of the lowest energy ways to do that is putting it through a cooling tower uh, and it uses very low amount of energy, but it uses water. So it's actually good for energy efficiency, <laughs> but it's not so good for water efficiency. And we actually do have those trade-offs in sustainability all over. Our approach has been you actually can work both on operational energy and on, on your embodied carbon emissions. And that's part of the reason why we're bringing this tool to, to life on embodied emissions, Craig, is that we actually haven't had a, a, a conduit to be able to drive that change. Uh, and now we can, we can add that to the suite and have a, a tool in, performance, in, in operations and also a tool that can do a lot of work on, on those building materials. It is great that Nobis is actually looking at all those categories. Because I, I, I agree, like sometimes I'll look at a waste issue and you go, well, this option is great for waste, but it's bad for carbon or bad for water. So you have to be looking at it all as a holistic tool, which is where it's great that Nobis is doing that. A question here, electric vehicles demand will continue to increase in the years to come. How will Nobis in the industry ensure or push that EV stations be powered solely by renewables? I guess the first part of that is how will they push that it, the EV stations there in the first place, and then how they push that they're actually being fed by renewable energy. Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a great point, and it's good to remember that Neighbours is part of an ecosystem of initiatives that are, that are, that are driving change in buildings, and it's not the only lever that, that we have. Uh, but the, the National Construction Code has been doing a lot of work in, in this space on having buildings and having them to be EV ready when the, the growth in electric vehicles uh, starts to, 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 to grow. So we are seeing that through the National Construction Code. There's a few things coming up in this version of the, the NCC 2022 that is coming up uh, in a few weeks. We're expecting to see even more in, in the 2025 version. And we actually see a lot of the state governments very interested on, they're driving electric vehicles through their own programs, and they want to make sure that buildings are not a barrier for people. Like the availability of charging stations is important for people to feel confident about taking EVs. So we're seeing a lot of work on that. Um, often the role of neighbors in that space is actually as an advocate. We are in the room with the same people who are working on those policies. Neighbors is not always the right tool to say, we're gonna encourage you know, the uptake of EVs, but we are in the right places to influence and, and, and bring the importance of why those things should be considered and we need to do more work faster in that it's, space. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, isn't it? You kind of need the EV charges to, to be there first for people to, to encourage people to go to EVs. Another question here, uh, what are the benefits of participating in the SPI and how much does it cost? Right. So What's the cost, man? <laughs> yeah, so the cost of uh, uh, the SPI is zero. Um, it doesn't cost, doesn't cost anything. Um, the, the way the SPI works is that if you have neighbors ratings, you can actually, you can voluntarily participate on the SPI. We do this once a year. Uh, it's usually around, around February to, to March. We do a big call out organizations come in, they basically tell us, uh, uh, the main thing that we need to know, by the way, is that we know their buildings and we know their performance, but we don't know all the buildings in that portfolio. And often the way we structure the SBI is that we do this around, the organization is actually a fund. And the reason why we do that is because we, if you're going to invest in a company, if you're an investor, uh, you're not investing in uh, Lend Lease per se. Lend Lease has seven funds or eight funds inside of that. You probably invest your money in one of them. Um, so we are going th with a fund structure, um, and, but we don't know what are exactly all the buildings in that fund. How many of them have been certified in the neighbors and how many have not been certified? So the process is very simple. You basically express your interest to participate and you tell us all the buildings inside of that asset. Uh, and it's a couple of extra steps we take because we want a, a sworn declaration from those portfolios. So we know that that is really the, the full list of, of portfolios but it's a really simple process um, you don't have to do any work you just have to have your buildings uh, certified under neighbors uh, and if you haven't participated before just reach out to us right now we've launched this a couple of months ago but with there's a lot of things that we can do even before the next stage of of this is released it's been a lot today about finance and the way in which finance can actually be a way to push this change for instance with green loans you know if you are able to say well you get cheaper money if you do the right thing it's been great 
But I was glad to see you talking about that whole credibility gap. I mean, that's, that's a big part of this is people get so confused by so many different systems out there. So is Neighbours looking to become the place you go to where you can judge whether, whether or not there's good green loans, whether things are actually sustainable? Um, I, I think that the sustainable finance is a very, very big space. So I don't think that we're looking to be the only source of truth, but I think we do bring something that is really unique uh, to this space. And there is that there are thousands of buildings right now that had a, a qualified professional measuring the carbon footprint and certifying that asset with a consistent standard. And that is gold in the sustainable finance space because a lot of these transactions just don't have that. They just don't have reliable information that is certified by government with qualified professionals. And we've had a lot from the, 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 particularly from banks in particular saying, can we, how can we use neighbors more consistently? Can we embed it into our own policies? Can we put a lot of our lending processes? Can we put a, you know, a certified bond in a way that is consistent and scalable across hundreds of assets instead of having to do this for every billion that comes in? I think we can bring scalability and, and, and robustness of information. And I think that is definitely something that we're looking to grow. So we want to expand this line of work and see neighbors' ratings used as much as we can for sustainable finance instruments. That's great. There are a few more questions there, but uh, Carlos will have to do them as homework later on <laughs> after this to get back to you. Thank you so much, Carlos, for those, that talk and the answers there. Uh, for those, yeah, again, if, keep the questions coming in and they will be addressed later on in the day. Uh, now, just a quick introduction to what's going to happen after the lunch break in our deep dive sessions. Um, we're going to have a break first, but after the break, we'll have our first stream of exciting series of concurrent deep dive sessions in four different rooms, each with a different focus. A uh, reminder that there will be recordings for each of the different sessions, so don't worry if you're missing out on one of them. Stream one after lunch is for assessors with insights shared in accelerating the uptake of renewable energy. Stream two is for neighbours customers, where you can learn to, the secret to unlocking green investment uh, one star at a time. Stream three is for government attendees entitled Sticks, Carrots and Tambourines, How Government Can Encourage Energy Efficient Buildings. And last but not least, the stream four for new neighbours customers who will learn how to embark on the journey to six stars for those just starting out. Each deep dive session will run for 30 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, after the first session, there'll be a small break and then there'll be a second uh, four streams that are put up there. Uh, stream one is for assessors. We'll be sharing information about embodied emissions, expansion and neighbours platform. Stream two is for neighbours customers, where the panel will share insights on the catalytic role of energy efficiency in reaching net zero. Stream three is a CBD assessors masterclass. And stream four is for building owners, where we'll be discussing delivering maximum returns with energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, we'll be back together at the end of each deep dive for our wrap-up panel session with Carlos, Carlos Flores again, moderating reflections on the day. So on that note, it's time for a tea break. Uh, log in to choose your deep dive session, which will start in 15 minutes at 12.30. Thanks again, Carlos. <laughs>